1 Thessalonians 2, victory is always secured at the end and not at any time before then. The farmer doesn't claim a great crop before the harvest. The athlete doesn't claim victory before the final gun, the last putt, the last out, the last lap. The businessman doesn't claim success until the end of the year and all the monies are counted. The developer doesn't claim to be finished until people buy his homes and live in his development. The student can claim victory in class until his grades are entered after his tests are finished. The programmer isn't done coding. The software must be sold first and he has to fix all the bugs. And the politician doesn't take office until all the votes are counted. Victory isn't secured until the end and not at any time before then. I remember in history class seeing the famous picture of President Truman holding up the newspaper that said, Dewey beats Truman. And of course, that was wrong. You think, who is Dewey? Exactly. Some of you don't even know who I'm talking about. He was the, the guy who everybody thought was president when they went to bed the night of the election, only to find out the next morning that he wasn't. In Christian terms, we are being told that we have been defeated. We're told we've been defeated in our culture, it's certainly in our government, in entertainment. Influencers on social media like to rub our nose in our defeat. Society says we've defeated. It does seem like we've lost when you think about how people who once claimed to be Christians are now rejecting Christian faith. Christian leaders, once popular, falling into sin. Our nation seemingly built on a Judeo-Christian ethic, is turning away from Christ, and our culture is growing increasingly corrupt. And so you must say, God is losing. He's lost. And the problem with this mentality is that it discourages Christians from thinking as they should. We start thinking things like, you know, the broad road, the one that leads to destruction, may actually be the better road. Or the pleasures of sin, why not? They are better than the riches of Christ. And the temporal things, well, they must be better than the eternal things. Earth is better than heaven. That's loser talk. Our opponents want us to think that way. They want us to think that we've lost. The game is over. The way things are now is the way they always will be. Let me take you into the locker room. It's halftime. And now the Apostle Paul is going to give us his locker room speech. His halftime talk. We have another half to play. And let me share with you the speech Paul gives to people who might have been tempted to think that they were losing when actually they were on the cusp of winning. Number one, do not let opposition, our opposition, do not let our opposition prevent you from living the Christian life. You see, Christians are opposed by those who hate Christ. God's enemies, should this surprise us, want to harm God's people. Paul writes, for you, brothers, became followers of the churches of God in Judea, which are in Judea, are in Christ Jesus, because you have suffered like things of your own countrymen as they have of their own countrymen. You see, the Thessalonians had suffered like things. Paul is comparing the Thessalonian, the Gentile church, with the Jewish church in Judea. And the comparison is that they were both suffering. And what were they suffering? Paul says the Jewish church had murdered people. They had murdered Jesus. They had murdered their prophets. Murder is probably the worst of the things that we think of people can suffer. I don't know that I've known anyone in my lifetime who's been murdered. When I was in school, a friend of mine, his name was Harold, 
this was in high school, his grandfather worked at a convenience store and was murdered. That's probably the only person I can think of off the top of my head who I know, someone who knows someone who was murdered. Murder is a horrible thing. These people in Judea were suffering murder at the hands of the Jews. Paul says, you are suffering like things. He also says they were targeting Paul and his apostolic team. They have persecuted us. They are trying to drive us away. And certainly they had driven them away from Thessalonica after just a few weeks. You see, unbelievers, those who hate Christ, can become aggressively hostile against those who love Christ. We who follow Jesus can become the target of those who hate Jesus. And notice what Paul says of these people who hate Jesus. They were opposed to the welfare of people. They didn't want Gentiles converting to Christianity. This would be God's favor on the Gentiles. Certainly a converted populace, a citizenry of Christian people is a blessing to a nation. And so these were intolerant of evangelism. Can I just stop and say that is absolutely true today in our culture. If you want to experience this, grab a handful of gospel tracts, go down to where the bars are in Raleigh, go on to any of the college campuses in our area, go to where people assemble and just start telling people good news, even though you're a sinner, you can be saved from your sins and you will find people who will curse you and spit at you. And if they could hurt you physically without any repercussions, they absolutely would. Those who hate Jesus, if you are following Jesus, they hate you too. Now, these hostilities, Paul says, were unpleasing to God. These are not God pleasers. Those who are hostile against God's people, well, they're not pleasing the Lord. In fact, he says they're increasing their sins and they are being prepared for God's wrath. They are actually justifying God's wrath on them. What he will say to them one book later, these same Christians, that Jesus will come someday in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God. It's kind of weird to think about, but in 2 Thessalonians 1, the Apostle Paul actually says to people who are suffering, you wait, the doctrine of hell is real and these who hate Jesus and are persecuting you they will get theirs and if you understand the doctrine of eternal punishment you need to understand it is not something for believers to lament over rather we rejoice that God is a God of justice And though we wish no one to go to hell, I hope you don't. We also understand that those who've rejected Jesus, that is where they belong. Because they are hostile against their creator. So while we're suffering persecution, we should remain faithful, let her be, in spite of opposition. He says in verse 14, for you brothers became followers of the churches in Judea. You see, the church is a brotherhood of saints in Christ. Notice that he calls them brothers. That's, that's our word for brotherhood, for family. No, we're not family by DNA. We're not family by blood. You look around the room here, even in, in our place, people from all over the world. You trace your families, and of course we can all go back to Noah, I suppose, but you trace your families to the different people groups of the world. Isn't it great that we're family in Christ? That we have that brotherhood in Christ. In fact, I, one modern translation, just to make it crystal clear what he's saying, calls them brothers and sisters because no one gender is intended. He's not saying you, you men out there, <laughs> you, you're brothers, women. He's not saying that. He says all of you are family. And this comes after the words you all, for you all. 
That word ye in King James is plural. You all, brothers, implying Paul is referring to the whole congregation of believers. In this sense, it's a reference to the church. They were remaining faithful to the things of God. They were faithful following. They were imitators of the idea of suffering like things. They were willing to go through everything the people in Judea were going through for their faith in Christ. So they were suffering in the same way, but they were also responding to that suffering in the same godly way as those who were in Christ in other places. And I think this brings then the question, how are you responding to suffering or potential suffering in Christ? Because of your faith, are you willing to stand up for Jesus in a culture that is increasingly hostile against Jesus? Are you willing to lose your job for him? Are you? Stop a moment. Are you willing to lose your job for Jesus? Are you willing to be mocked for Jesus? Made fun of? Are you willing to become a public outcast for Jesus? The world hates him. And it's going to hate you too. You see... As we follow Jesus, we will be hated by those who hate him. So, it's best if we just stop and recognize that all of that hatred comes from the king of hate himself, Satan, our adversary. This is point number two. Recognize that our opposition is ultimately from Satan. Satan is the adversary behind the adversaries. You see what he says in verse 18, Satan hindered us. Satan prevented from Paul's visiting these brothers in Thessalonica. Now notice Paul doesn't use the word devil. He doesn't use the name devil. The name devil means slanderer. That's a name for Satan. There are many names for Satan in the Bible. He's the dragon. He's the snake. Lots of different names. But here he uses the word satanus. That's how it reads in Greek. Satanus. This is the angel who fell from heaven because he wanted to take God's place. He is the one who's called the sinner. The first who sinned. His name, satanus, means enemy. He is the opposer. The adversary. He is the one who is evil, and he is the one who is against God. So he's the one who stands up against God's people and God's ministry. Think about this for a second. Satan wants to hurt the children's ministries of our church and would do anything he could to destroy that. Some of you your children are in Christian schools. Satan would love to close those schools. Some of you homeschool your children. Satan would love nothing more than to shutter those schools. Some of you send your children to the public school. Satan would love to put people in the path of your children who would hurt your children spiritually, tear them down, rip their faith apart. That's what he would love to do. He is the adversary. Satan wants to pervert our worship. He wants us to worship like the world worships its own gods. Satan would love for our church to become a, a nightclub, a dance hall. And if you can believe it, I actually saw a video this week of Mark Driscoll. Some of you don't know who he is. But Mark Driscoll used to be pastor of a church out in Seattle, Washington. In fact, a uh, a friend of mine from high school used to be his women's ministries leader of this giant megachurch. Mark Driscoll is as um, far to the left and still evangelical as you can be. And he was lecturing another pastor in his church because that pastor at a men's retreat had a male stripper dancing on a pole. And then Mark Driscoll called him out 
And I thought, well, praise God for Mark Driscoll today, right? <laughs> that guy wasn't really dancing. He was kind of more doing acrobatic stuff, but it was weird. It was weird. God would love our worship to be like that, perverted. You know, he would love to lessen, I'm sorry, not God, Satan. Satan would love to lessen our outreach. He would. Make us irrelevant, not noticed. He wants to end our prayerfulness and make us prayerless. He would love to rob you of your hope. Just take it away. Make you think you're losing. Make you think it's worthless. He would love to dissolve your family. Do you realize that? He would love to ruin your marriage. Right now, he, he is planning and plotting for how he can drive a wedge between you and your spouse. He would love to destroy our Christian unity. He plants little seeds of bitterness in your heart. Well, somebody didn't treat me right. Somebody didn't smile at me when I walked in the door. The pastor mentioned everybody else. He didn't mention me. His, their children got awarded for something my children didn't. He'd love to dissolve our Christian unity. He is trying to destroy us. His work, let her be, is to thwart the ministry of God's servants. You see, we brothers being taken from you a short time in presence, this is verse 17, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face, but Satan hindered us. You see, our spiritual goals can be thwarted. Paul wanted to see those new believers again himself, and his desire was, was not just a one-time thing. He had this ongoing pressing in his spirit, this, this burden once, and again he says, I, Paul, wanted to come to you. He got up in the morning and thought about them. I pray for you constantly, day and night. I want to come to you and see your face, but I can't because Satan is standing in the way. St. Paul's desire was motivated by their spiritual welfare. He wanted to help them spiritually, to encourage them and to strengthen them. And this was so evident that he would not be thrown off by the suffering that they were enduring. He said, he said I want to come and, and help you see that the suffering you're facing is okay. It's godly suffering. It's what Jesus suffered. It's what the God's people suffer. It's temporal and short term. And one day you'll receive a blessing that is eternal and that is much more valuable in glory. These Thessalonians were at war with Satan. We are at war with Satan. And we don't know why Paul was incapable of visiting the Thessalonians, likely some kind of persecution. He would have been murdered himself if he had arrived back in Thessalonica. But the human face of persecution was the Jews is just a mask for the real persecutor, the rage that Satan has against Almighty God. Remember what Paul wrote to the Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, people, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. He's talking about the devil Satan, he's talking about the demons who work for Satan. These are our enemies. I guess the real question is, do you recognize that you are at war with Satan right now? Do you see the spiritual war that you're in? He opposes us constantly everywhere and every day. He opposes you trusting the gospel. He, he opposes people from being saved. He wants to keep people lost. He, he opposes you reading and studying and meditating on your Bible. He wants to fill your mind with his philosophy. And if he can do that through entertainments and if he can do that through sports or any other means, just to keep God out. He wants to, he opposes you loving God. He wants you to love anything else other than him. He opposes you serving God. He loves selfish believers. He opposes you having firm biblical convictions. He calls those people legalists. Satan calls them legalists. <coughs> who have firm biblical convictions. He opposes you witnessing to your neighbor. 
He'd love you to talk to your neighbor about sports, about the, the ball team, about family, about trimming your bushes, anything other than Jesus. He opposes your children. Listen, boys and girls, he doesn't want you to obey your parents. He wants you to violate the fifth commandment. To dishonor your parents. And I firmly believe that this is one of the most violated commands in the modern church. You say, how is that? Because the heart of the fifth commandment is that their children would not just honor their parents, but would grow up to imitate their parents. And you teenagers who want independence, and you should have it, it's coming. I used to tell my children, be patient, you'll be independent soon. You will, you will. Just, you don't need to be independent today, okay? You don't have any money anyway. But if you grow up and you leave home, and I'll, I'll be cordial to my mom and dad, but you will have nothing to do with the way they live their lives. You're going to live your life completely differently? That's dishonoring your mom and dad. You know, parents, Satan opposes you consistently and biblically disciplining your children. Do you, you know what's, why you have to discipline children? It's not just so that they have sloppy rooms and messy tables. It's not, it's not just so that their lives are kind of broken down. It's because it reminds them that they're sinners and they need a savior. The, the application of discipline on children is the first lesson of the gospel. And you don't realize that this is true until you run into people who, when you ask them if they are sinners, they say, no, I've never sinned. You've never sinned. Oh, I've made mistakes. I've had accidents. I've done things that I guess were wrong, but I've never sinned. They, they just don't believe it. <laughs> My children had no no way of coming to that conclusion because we reinforced on them. You are a sinner all the time. Right back here. <laughs> we reinforced it. And Satan wants to keep you from consistently and biblically disciplining your children. He wants to call it child abuse. He wants to throw in your face scientific studies. You can have all the scientific studies you want. Science is theory. Let me give you a fact. Disciplining your children is biblical. Not abusing your children, I get that. It's wrong to do that. But biblical discipline is not abuse. Do you know, grandparents, all of you who have white hair, just kind of look up. If you can't see any hair or if it's white, do you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to retire. He wants you to retire. You can, you leave your job, you can just leave everything behind. You don't have to serve God anymore. You did that when your kids were growing up. You know, people go to church for their children. They show up when their children are little. Their children leave the home, they leave. They were just there for their kids. That's not what God wants from you. He, he opposes you using your extra time in retirement in service to God. He doesn't want you using that extra time for, for God. He wants you to use it for your spouse. It's your golden years. He wants you, you to use it for your grandkids. It's your, it's your time. Finally, you've been working all your life. This is your time. And young adults, all of you in between, you know what he doesn't want? He doesn't want you leaving your hands and trusting the Lord. God is trying to teach you to trust him. He, he's trying to teach you to trust him when your children are little the lessons you're learning to trust him as they're growing. And he's reinforcing this and reinforcing this as you struggle financially and you struggle with your kids. And even in the last week, I've been reminded of, of parents struggling with their children. And it's easy to think, oh, the struggle's not worth it. It is. It so is. And Satan's the one who wants you to stop. You see, we're at war with him right now. 
all those who are unbelievers are at war with believers. And the force behind them is Satan himself. But, number three, God will triumph over all as he glorifies himself in you. You see, it's, it's, Satan opposes anything having to do with Jesus, and he's a powerful foe. He's an ancient enemy. We can't outsmart him. He's smarter than we are. We can't out, uh, wrestle him. He's stronger than we are. But his opposition does not reduce or limit what God is doing in you. You see, God is winning in your life right now. God is winning for what is our hope, verse 19, or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even you all. You are winning because God is winning in you. The gospel produces true saints. He really does change you. When you become a, a Christian and a follower of Jesus, you actually come to a place where you have now following a different path, a different life, a different lifestyle, a different desire. You have taken upon yourself the cross of Jesus. You deny yourself and you follow after him. You become an imitator of those in front of you and you find out that the hope and joy and crown of rejoicing is you because this is what God is doing in you. He's changing your life completely. So as Paul says, of these same Thessalonians, you were once idolaters bowing down to carved images of creatures and people and, and different celestial bodies. You bowed down to them and you called them your God, but now you worship the true God. You were once living for today. Carpe diem. Seize the day. You were as so many in our culture trying to live for the nasty now and now, but now you're living for eternity. You were once loving self, promoting self, always selfishly doing and saying things that would always bring glory to self, but now you are living for others because you love others. This is what God does. He changes you. He changes you. You don't change yourself. You don't become a Christian and begin to change because you're changing yourself. In fact, half the time, the, cha the change kind of looks like the guy who doesn't want to leave the room. You know, he's scratch clawing at the door. <laughs> I don't want to change. But God's going to change you anyway. It's better off if you just let him change you. But as human nature will have it, we sometimes fight that change. And that can be painful. But God changes you. He's transforming your life. He is sanctifying you. And if you know him as your savior, he's the one bringing the change. So in spite of Satan's opposition, there's hope in perseverance. There's real hope. This is a hope that God provides, not something man can produce. It's our faith turned forward to see all of the promises that God has given us that still are unrealized, but will be ours someday. And it's so true, it is as if they are already ours right now. And so we can persevere. We can keep running, even though our lungs burn and our legs are jelly. We can keep running the race for Christ there's hope and perseverance. You know, there's joy and faithfulness. This is what comes from living a long time with Jesus. It's a true joy that rejoices even in the midst of suffering. Let me tell you something right now. You can fake spiritual maturity. You can fake it right now. You can fake it. You can look apart, speak the part. You can fake it. But when you reach old age, and you eventually will, all of you young people, you're going to get old. You're going to get wrinkly. Your skin's all going to sag. And you won't be able to fake it then. Everyone will be able to see that person's not as mature as she seemed to be. She seemed to be so godly. 
but she can't even trust the Lord for the smallest things. She seemed to be so godly, but she's relying on herself all the time. He seemed to be such a Christian servant, but he doesn't even believe the very things he taught other people. He seemed to be such a man of God, but he's still caught up with the foolish lusts of a teenager. What's wrong? He doesn't have the joy of faithfulness. And so as an older person, he still struggles with some of those things that should be in the past. Oh, Satan wants that. But in spite of his opposition, we can find the joy of faithfulness and we can find victory in Christ. I love this. What is our crown of rejoicing? He says, what is our victory? It is the Stephanos, the laurel wreath that they would wear at the games on their heads, indicating that they had won the race. He says, you, you are our crown. Other people would say of Paul, you know, what do you have to show for your ministry? All this work, all those times in jail, all the times being beaten and shipwrecked and persecuted and hungry and, as he says in Philippians, naked and starving, all the things you went through. What'd you get out of it, Paul? And Paul says, victory. I get a crown of rejoicing. That in glory I can say him and him and him and her and her. These were the people that I poured myself into by God's grace. And through me, God changed their lives. You are my crown of rejoicing. You're the victory I have in Christ. And so we can look at each other and say, this is what God is calling us all to do. To pour ourselves into each other. And to have that same victory. So that when he comes, we ultimately win. Are you not even, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Yeah, we're halftime. It seems like we're losing. But you are our glory and joy. It, it isn't temporal. It's so hard to get into our minds that this time, this short time of life, it ends. Look at a yardstick. Your life is the first little line on the stick and eternity goes on forever. On thousands and millions and billions of years. If there is a year. That's what life is. It's eternal. And a hundred years from now, this will mean nothing. A thousand years from now, this will mean nothing. 10,000 years from now, this will mean nothing. And all the things that we cherish, all the things that we fret over, all the things that we desire in our hearts will be nothing then because they are nothing. And then he alone, he, he alone will be all that matters. Our hope and joy and victory endure to the coming of the Lord that's the eschatological sense here. This is what's happening. He's talking all about the end. He's saying, you're, you're at the halftime. Look at the end. All those children you're pouring yourself into, and they seem ungrateful, and it seems sometimes like it's not working. God's using that. Your children at home, God's using you. All those people in your community that you're pouring yourself into that don't seem to care, that's okay. God's using you. And one day you can rejoice because when Jesus comes, all these things are fully realized. When hope becomes sight and joy becomes permanent and victory is assured, we boast in that. We exult in that. And if you fight against your adversary, do not be discouraged because God will win the victory. It was a Saturday afternoon in January of 1992, I was just turned 22 years old, maybe a, less than a month, about a month. And as a lot of 22-year-olds will do on a Saturday afternoon, you're in college, you don't want to study. So I turned on the television. This is where you have to go over across the room and click it on. 
and then hope the picture comes in. And I remember laying on our couch in our living room, lying or laying, I don't know. One of the, I, was, I wasn't upright. And I started watching a football game. Back then, the NFL started playing their games on Saturdays. It wasn't just all on Sundays. And I thought, this is great. And so I was watching a football game. It was a playoff game between the Houston Oilers. The Houston Oilers. That tells you how long ago that was. And, and they were playing against the Buffalo Bills. And the Buffalo Bills starting quarterback was Jim Kelly. And he was injured. And so a guy named Frank Reich, who, by the way, is a believer, a genuine, died-in-the-wool, godly Christian. Frank Reich was the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills. He was the backup quarterback. And Buffalo was losing. In fact, the Bills um, uh, were getting crushed by the Houston Oilers. And Warren Moon, do you remember him, anybody? Warren Moon? Warren Moon was the quarterback of the Oilers, and they were scoring and scoring and scoring and scoring. And at halftime, it was 28 to 3. And, and the <laughs> opening of the second half, there was an interception return for a touchdown, and then it was 35 to 3. And then something really strange happened because it was after that touchdown, it was like the whole game turned around. Five touchdowns later, and the Bills were up 38 to 5. They went from losing 35 to 3 to being up 38 to 5. The game went into overtime. The Bills won the game and eventually went to the Super Bowl, where they lost. But this is probably considered to be one of the greatest comebacks of all time. Can you imagine how all those players felt when it was 35 3 and your quarterback just threw an interception? The other team scores. You're getting killed. How easy it would have been? I'm not going to block anymore. My body hurts all over. I'm bruised all over. It's like I've been in a car wreck. I'm not going to block anymore. I'm not going to run a route anymore. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to lay down and, and wait for tomorrow to come, cash my pay paycheck, and just go to Florida and play golf. But there was something in them that said, "We're going to keep on." And they could have given up, down 32 points with less than one half remaining to go. And everyone would have understood. They were being dominated, but they hadn't lost. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it feels like we're losing. I'm telling you, it feels like it. Every day I get up and I feel it. I read the New York Post and, and I feel like we're losing. You see what's going on in our culture politically between two parties who would jail each other if they could. And two political candidates with whom I just go, this is what we have. And if you don't understand what I mean, just go back four presidential cycles, five presidential cycles back. Go back to when it was Ronald Reagan running against Jimmy Carter. I would give my right arm to go back to Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Two people who at least had some modicum of respect. It feels like we're losing. Culturally, it feels like we're losing. When you see people stand up and they're obviously men and they look like women. They dress like a woman. They act like a woman or what they think a woman is. They don't really know because they have no idea because they're not women. And vice versa. It feels like we're losing. And then you read about all of the ways that people are trying to hurt each other in the world. And what's going on in Israel and Ukraine and Africa. And by the way, all that anybody talks about is Israel and Ukraine because we don't even care what happens in Africa. And all the horrible things that are going on there. And it really is racism because they don't look like us. Some of us. And it feels like we're losing. 
And then you open up this book and you remind yourself, Jesus is coming again. And he will be king over this whole world. He, we're not losing. We're winning. So, act like it. Let's pray. Now, Lord Jesus, come back. Come back. <laughs>